Hi, I wanted to talk this week about uh, a subject that I've kind of wanted to address for a long time, and this is not the easiest of topics uh, to address. It's very uh, divisive uh, in, in the field of tabletop wargaming, and that subject is settings. So the, the background, the narrative context, the fictional universe, the historical period, whatever it might be, I wanted to talk about settings and how they interact with design and what the challenges are when when addressing various different kinds of setting. And I'm going to try really hard not to get too deep into the weeds on this. And if I say anything, I'm going to try not to say anything mean about any settings because all settings are, are, are wonderful. Um, if I say anything mean about any games, which I am occasionally inclined to do, please understand that I'm specifically talking about the, the game and not the setting of the game. So, to, to press on, there are really three kinds of setting, and I'm not going to dwell a lot on this because it's the third one that I really want to talk about today. So the first kind of setting is a historical setting. Now, I am not an historian, um, I, I am a, a historical enthusiast, but I am a long way from being the kind of war gamer that fixates upon the minutiae. So, when I talk about historical settings, if you are a historical wargamer and, and an enthusiast for your particular period, please understand that I am not, and if I make mistakes, it is not out of a lack of respect. Um, I'm just ignorant. Okay, So, um, historical settings are both one of the easiest and one of the hardest uh, contexts in which to write a miniatures wargame. Now, it's easy in respect of the, there are the work has been done. You know, stuff happened. Uh, events occurred and academics have studied those events to provide enough detail that we can create uh, a game in that setting. Um, so, so in that respect, if you want to say this is a game set in uh, early Republican Rome, say, or uh, Mycenaean Greece, or anything along those lines, you know, it, it, Sengoku Jedi in Japan, or um, Empire of Mali, just to throw some ideas out that are, that are really exciting, interesting periods in history about which we know varying amounts. And the, the one thing which historical settings don't really do, which people think it does but it doesn't, is that they don't restrict our creativity all that much. Um, in some respects they actually encourage creativity because there are a lot of gaps in history, especially the deeper we go or the further back we go we encounter gaps in our knowledge that we can persuasively fill with imaginative content um, so it's not that that historical settings restrain our creativity but they do put some restraints on the designer um, and one of the key restraints they place on the designer is that historical warfare involves a lot of humans and generally, those humans enjoy the same level of technological advancement. Um, there are, again, historians, experts, I realise this is not necessarily my, my field. I'm not suggesting that all societies are equally technologically advanced at the same time. That is obviously not true. But unless you're writing a game that is specifically focused on a specific uh, conflict where the technological differences between the participating sides are very clearly defined in, in the source material, if you're writing rules for a more generic period, then inevitably there's going to be a lot of similarities between different factions with any given setting. Um, so in that sense, it's both a, a restraint and a challenge to the designer to make the participating factions or groups within a historical setting distinctive to themselves. And that challenge does lead us occasionally into, into the realm of stereotyping. Uh, I, funnily enough, I recently was reading a blog by a friend of mine, um, and I will try and put a link to his blog in, in the notes on this episode. Uh, and he's putting together a, an Italian force for bolt action. And there are some rules for Italians, 
in bolt action that basically mean that they are far more likely to break and run away. And that taps into a, a stereotypical accounting of the Second World War, which, as far as I'm aware, doesn't actually entirely stack up to reality. You know, the reputation that, that the Italian forces of that period had for poor morale and, and an ease, a, a likelihood to withdraw or, or capitulate, um, I don't think is really supported fairly by the evidence. Uh, now, as I say, if you are an expert and you believe otherwise, do please say so in the comments, um, but that's certainly my impression. So that's what I mean about, again, drifting into stereotyping to, to tap into characteristics of a faction that, that sit well within our imagination, but which aren't necessarily true to the source material and which are a little bit unfair to, to our modern sensibilities. So that's uh, historical, which is one kind of setting that is uh, a challenge with it in its own way for the game designer. The second one I wanted to talk about, which brings a similar set of challenges, is the established intellectual property. So a fictional setting that wasn't written for a game, or at least wasn't written for the game that you, the designer, are trying to write. Uh, there are plenty of examples of this. Um, established IPs that are popular in miniatures wargaming, of course, include... Star Wars intellectual property that makes up the series of games made by uh, Asmodee and their, their miniatures design team at Atomic Mass Games that they, of course, adopted in a large part from Fantasy Flight. Uh, speaking of Atomic Mass Games, we should mention Marvel Crisis Protocol, another example of a very well-established intellectual property, albeit a very broad one, uh, into which a miniatures game has been added. Batman the miniatures game game there's one which is a, a real challenge to the designer um a song of ice and fire uh miniatures game uh, gosh it's another asmodee game uh, it must be something about asmodee they have acquired a song of ice and fire the miniatures game from cool mini or not um so that's a, another example of an established intellectual property into which a game must be inserted now the established intellectual property Oh, before I move on, uh, because I've mentioned a lot of Asmodee games, let me mention some ones which aren't Asmodee. Um, so Walking Dead, Mantic Games, and Mars Attacks, also Mantic Games. Um, so those are other established intellectual properties into which a game has been installed. Uh, and Modifius, of course, also have licenses for Fallout and um, The Elder Scrolls. So again, two other examples of very uh, uh, well-respected uh, and well-beloved intellectual properties into which a miniatures game has to be installed. Now, it's interesting that we've got a real selection of different kinds of intellectual property here. We've got Star Wars and Mars Attacks, which are movies. We've got Walking Dead, which is a comic book. Uh, we've got A Song of Ice and Fire, which is a novel series. And then we've got something like um, The Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, uh, or Fallout, which of course is a computer game, which has been now turned into a miniatures game by Modifius Entertainment. Writing a game, now the first challenge for any designer writing a game for an intellectual property is that the IP has to be licensed, um, which is expensive. But fundamentally that's not a challenge of design, that's a challenge of business, so we'll put that to one side. The challenges of design that apply to an intellectual property are twofold. First of all, you have very little leeway to manipulate the setting to make it fit your game better. It's not to say no leeway, but very little. Um, there are examples where games have themselves fed back into settings. A uh, good example that comes to my mind is the original Star Wars roleplay game, which actually created a whole lot of content for other races and backgrounds and worlds and technology in the Star Wars universe, which not all of it was adapted by canon, but a good amount of it either was grandfathered into canon or influenced the direction that the canon eventually took. So, you know, games can do it. But at that point, when that first Star Wars game was written, I don't think that the value of the Star Wars IP had been fully understood. This is very early in the days of developing games for IPs. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of stands as an exception. In, in modern intellectual property management, when people are 
very conscious of the value of their IP uh, and very protective of it, it's much harder to write a game that beds in. Um, so that's, that's sort of the first challenge is that you, you have very little freedom of manoeuvre. Um, and it's not like historical settings. Now, admittedly, in historical settings, you know, th there are sort of established facts, but history does leave quite a lot of room for interpretation, as I mentioned. You know, you don't have, certainly the further back you go in history, you don't have the minutiae of experience to draw upon from first-hand accounts and evidence um, to, to really say for certain how people were or how they behaved or how they acted. Whereas when you get a fictional intellectual property, you have somebody who is the custodian of that IP, whether they're the author or whether they're the IP manager for the brand, who absolutely is going to have an opinion on every point of minutiae. So you actually have less room for manoeuvre when dealing with a, a, an intellectual property than you do when dealing with at least some historical periods. The other challenge with writing a game for an intellectual property isn't just about the room for manoeuvre, but is then about the expectations of the pre-existing fan community. Now, one could say the same thing applies for historical settings. Um, there are certainly people who have very strong opinions about how one should wargame certain historical periods. Um, but I think because history is in a state of constant re-evaluation, I don't think the experience is, is quite so intense. And also, I think that, that enthusiasts for history are enthusiasts for interpretation and reinterpretation, whereas enthusiasts for an established IP are much more emotionally invested in the static and settled nature of that IP. So as a game designer, you have to anticipate that kind of response. I suppose that's true of anybody working on any new creative endeavour embedded in an IP. You know, novelists, artists, sculptors, animators, any of those ha have to deal with the same problem. More unique to the game designer um, is then writing a game that captures the essence of the intellectual property in game form. And that is by far far and away the most challenging ask. Um, and we'll talk about how those two things interact later in the podcast, but that is a, a real challenge, and some games do it better than others. Star Wars Legion, in my opinion, uh, and I'm not a, a big player of Star Wars Legion, so, so I appreciate that my knowledge of the game perhaps isn't, isn't as deep as it could be, but in terms of the game itself, um, I don't think it's that interesting a game. I think it's made interesting by the setting in which it is set. Uh, I don't think the game itself does a, an especially good job of capturing the flavour of the Star Wars setting. Um, I think most of the heavy lifting in that respect is carried by the miniatures. Um, and, and there's not much about the game itself that screams Star Wars at you. Of course, you could well throw back at me and say, well, what would achieve that, Roby? Well, I don't know, because I'm not the designer on that game. So, you know, I do have to hold my hands up and say, look, I know that there were some very, very good designers involved in developing that game. I'm sure that they addressed this problem. I'm sure that their solution was the best they could have done with what they did. And I'm absolutely not saying that I could have done any better. Um, but, you know, the, the game itself doesn't, I think, it, to me, it doesn't capture the essence of what makes Star Wars Star Wars. Uh, by contrast, uh, I, I would look at Modiphius's Fallout game, which does an extremely good job of capturing that essence of the, the Fallout setting. Um, I, I don't know enough about the Elder Scrolls game to say whether it does. My initial impression was, was not so much, funnily enough, and I don't know why, because other than one setting being fantasy and one being post-apocalyptic retro sci-fi, they're really similar. Stylistically and constructively, uh, mechanically, they're, they're really similar settings, so I'm not sure why the two games themselves don't seem to me to capture the setting to the same degree. Uh, I, I could go through others uh, and pick them up. Um, A Song of Ice and Fire, 
I suppose I should put at the top of the list as being a game that really, really does a good job of capturing the essence of the setting. And I, I have talked in other podcasts about what I think it's done that, that has achieved that so effectively. So, you know, that's that's the real challenge to the designer in the IP, isn't just writing a good game, but writing a good game that also embeds itself into the intellectual property. Whew. So we did historical settings, we've done established IP settings, and the third kind of setting is everybody's favourite, it's my favourite, it's the one that there's the most to talk about, so I'm going to spend most of this episode talking about that. And that is, of course, the bespoke speculative setting. It's science fiction, it's fantasy, it's steampunk, it's post-apocalyptic, it's deep history, prehistoric, whatever you want to make it. Um, the, the bespoke speculative setting is the one that gets most people excited. It's the one that most designers want to write for. Um, it offers the greatest amount of freedom. Um, and it really lets a designer indulge their creativity, not just in the maths and the mechanics of game design, but also in the creation, um, either on their own or, or collaboratively with others, of a speculative setting. So I'm going to take a break. I'm going to come back in a moment and I'm going to talk more about speculative settings, where they sit within the design process, how the dialogue between design and setting go backwards and forwards, and what you might want to think about if you are trying to come up with a setting for your own game. So speculative settings for the designer are both one of the most attractive elements of game design and one of the biggest man traps to fall into. Um, it's really attractive because most people who are drawn to tabletop wargaming in the first place, especially in speculative settings, aren't necessarily drawn primarily to the experience of the game, but they're drawn to the experience of participating in a narrative. You know, when we when we lay out our miniatures on the tabletop to, to play a battle of some sort, the, the narrative context is often what first motivates us to want to pick up dice and, and exchange fire with an opponent. So, when you come out of that background and you move into wanting to write your own game, whether professionally or just for your own entertainment, naturally the setting is going to be one of the big exciting features. Now, in some cases you might be wanting to write a game that's that's a new game for an existing setting, in which case I refer you to my previous comments about writing games for an existing IP. But if you're writing for a brand new setting and you're writing it yourself, the first big uh, man trap for designers to fall into is that they get carried away with the setting and they'll do a huge amount of development and expansion and writing and imaginative work on, on your narrative context without actually thinking about the mechanics of the game. And I have seen this again and again with, with people coming to tabletop miniatures uh, game design that, that they get carried away with how the game will look without thinking about how the game will play. But at the same time, you know, I look back on my own design experience and, and a really good example is Horizon Wars, which I've got up here. Should have had it ready, really. Um, Horizon Wars is a really good example of a game where the design was completely done and completely finished and ready for publication before I even began writing the setting. And, you know, that was intentional at the time. Uh, and, and if this is a new game to you, it's not currently available uh, to buy. Uh, not, not new. You may find secondhand copies kicking around here and there, but it's, it's out of print at the moment. Um, when I wrote this game, um, I wanted a generic system. I didn't want a setting. I wanted a, a, a game that was a generic sci-fi battle game, and you could put it into any setting you, you cared to name and it would more or less work. Um, and that was a, a good design decision in some respects because it kept it very pure and it kept it very streamlined in terms of the content in the book. But at the same time, it did end up making the finished product extremely generic to a fault, uh, I say looking back. And Although I did develop a setting for it, the setting 
was only written to provide an excuse for people to fight rather than embedding the rules within the setting and you know that that ended up creating a very generic rule system very if i say so myself a very elegant very effective rule system but very very generic um and i think even though i wanted a generic game i think the game would have benefited more from an approach similar to what i did with the follow-up game which is horizon wars zero duck now with horizon Wars zero duck I began with a partial setting because it's set in the same background as, as the original Horizon Wars. But that setting was very, very broad. It was it, it had a history, but it didn't describe any real factions, it didn't describe any of the sort of the technology or the politics or the society in any great detail. It was just supposed to be broad brushstrokes to provide some context for the game. Whereas when I sat down to write this, I wanted it to be set in that pre-existing setting. Fortunately, it was mine, so I could do what I liked with it, and I could then adapt the context of that setting to what I wanted the game to do. And that's the lesson to take away when you're coming to writing a, a speculative miniatures game with a brand new setting that you're going to devise yourself. The important thing is to build the setting and the game alongside one another so that the setting reflects what you want the, chain, the game to do and the game itself remains embedded within the setting. Now, if you're looking to write a generic game like I do, a miniatures agnostic game where you're not trying to drive any particular product line, then the degree to which the game is embedded in the setting is going to be quite light. You know, you want to feel like the setting and the game riff off one another, but you don't want to feel like somebody couldn't just ignore the setting entirely and set the game in a, in, a, in a background, a context of their own devising. If, on the other hand, you are planning your game to be effectively a marketing tool, a tool to drive the sale of other products, typically miniatures, then you want the game to be much, much more embedded in the setting, so that the two are almost inextricable. Um, that the game really evokes something uh, essential from the setting. Good example of this would be something like War Machine uh, or Hordes, of course, its companion game, where one of the mechanics of the game is building up a supply of action points. They are Fury in Hordes, and I've forgotten what they're called in, in War Machine. Um, but you build up a supply of these points through your Warcaster, your central character that you can then allocate out to the main units, to the, the war jacks or to the war beasts in the game to actually perform the key tasks that you need to in order to win. And that's a really good example of a game where the setting and the, and the narrative are inextricably connected. If you took away the narrative, that mechanic in the game wouldn't make any sense. It would be too weird, too strange. It wouldn't connect to anything that was actually going on. Whereas when you embed it into the setting, all of a sudden it makes sense because you've got this narrative context in which the Warcaster is drawing on the natural power of magic around them in order to then imbue their steam-powered creatures with the strength and power they need to perform their tasks. And, and that then causes a, a synergy between the game and the setting that works. And, and it works both as a game and it works as a marketing tool, so you get the satisfaction of a well-designed and interesting game, and you get a marketing tool that drives the sale of the miniatures. Now, if you're not selling miniatures or if miniatures uh, are not core to, to your game, then you don't need to worry about that to the same extent, but you want a, a deeper connection between the setting and the game that isn't isn't based around the products that you're using. So uh, for a good example, go back to Horizon War Zero Dark, which I've tossed on the floor now, so I won't pick it up again. Um, but in that, for example, um, the, the mechanics of the game include an assumption that there is some level of darkness going on in the course of the battle, so that there is always some level of limited visibility. 
And that's because that's part of the setting. It's called Zero Dark because it is after an apocalypse on Earth and a lot of uh, material has been thrown into the atmosphere which is obscuring the sun, so it is basically dark all the time. In the day it is dark and at the night it is absolutely pitch black. So that darkness, as, as, a, as a narrative piece, is also a component of the game. Now it's not intricate, intimately connected because obviously it gets dark in all kinds of contexts, so the fact that it's always dark doesn't exclude you from putting it into some other setting, but it does evoke the game in the same way. So the evolution of setting then needs to be done in parallel in this context with the evolution of game. If you've got control over the setting, you can then tweak the setting to make sure that it fits in with what you want the game to achieve and to a lesser extent vice versa. Now I'm a game design first and a writer second, so I would say to an extent that I want the setting to follow the game. I want to write a, an interesting, compelling, engaging, exciting miniatures game experience, and I will mess with the setting as much as I need to to make that happen. If your approach to game design is more that you want to write an expansive setting and allow people to explore that setting through the context of a game, then maybe you're going to do it the other way around. But I would be very careful that in your enthusiasm for an expansive and immersive and exciting setting, you don't lose sight of what it takes to write a compelling game experience. Uh, and as ever, these conversations have to wind back to certain games. I'm actually not going to pick up on Games Workshop for a change here. What I'm going to do is pick up on... Uh, Infinity. Now I often speak about Infinity the game in, in glowing terms and I have a great deal of time for both the game and, and the company Corvus Belly behind it, but this is one example where in previous editions Infinity has lost touch with its setting when it's writing the game. The game, um, the, the setting for Infinity is, is quite deep. It's uh, it's never been explored that broadly in the miniatures game, but there's a related uh, roleplay game that's produced by Modiphius Entertainment, and the setting for all of that is being developed very closely in partnership with the guys in Corvus Belli who are behind the game of Infinity, and so they know all of the background and they know exactly where they wanted it to go. Um, and so Infinity has got this very deep, very expansive, very compelling setting but when it came to the game design, they let the game, or, or perhaps I should say rather than they let the game drift, they didn't let the game keep up with the setting. Um, and the game became bogged down in technical details and minutiae of rules because they wrote this very detailed game in their first and second edition that then got picked up as a tournament experience, that then meant that people were reading a lot into the rules for the minutiae, which meant that Corvus Belli got dragged into trying to clarify the rules and didn't refer back to the setting to make sure that the two were in sync. Now, they have addressed that to a great extent in the fourth edition, and they have really dragged the game back to bring it in sync with the setting. Whether they done it I don't want to say whether they've done enough of a job is not fair because that they consider they've done enough because that's what they've done as an enthusiast for the setting I still feel like the game is a little bit out of step um, that they haven't quite captured everything that one would want from the setting in the game now that's not to say that it's not great things like the hacking rules and the remote rules rules for units like the the um, puppet masters and uh, the post humans you know these very sort of signature uh, elements of the game are are incredibly uh, cyberpunk anime feel you know not only do the characters fit in with the aesthetics but the rules behind them fit in with the aesthetics and, and they're they're very exciting they're very imagination uh, sparking and they're great 
Where it loses traction, I think, is when you get into stuff like the rules for fire teams, uh, which are they were originally written as a as a bolt on set of rules after the first set of rules were written in second edition. So they wrote the second edition rules. They wrote the human sphere rules for second edition that brought in the fire team rules. And as a result, the fire team rules have always been a little bit of a compromise. And the fundamental structure of the fire team rules haven't changed from second, third to fourth edition. They are they are they're not the same, but the basic underpinning mechanic of them has been the same throughout, and it's never completely made sense in the context of the setting. That makes perfect sense in the context of a tabletop game and a tabletop game that is being optimised for tournament, balanced tournament play. I'm not going to argue or dispute that. That's absolutely true and mechanically they're a good set of rules. But do they make sense in the context of the setting? I don't feel they do. Others may disagree. But, but my sense is that that's a really good example of where the setting and the rules have gone adrift. Um, I could reference Warhammer 40,000 again as a game that itself is not fully embedded within the setting. Uh, but I think I've talked about that more than enough in the past, and I don't need to beat Games Workshop. Get the impression from some people they think I'm a Games Workshop hater. I'm not. I'm not. Games Workshop are like the gateway to our hobby in so many ways uh, and so much in our industry wouldn't be possible if Games Workshop didn't do what they do. So to that extent I'm very thankful. I, I just wish they wrote better games. Right, okay, uh, that's that setting um, and the integration of setting and game design and how different approaches to game design and what objectives you're trying to achieve are going to influence your relationship with setting. Let me know in the comments if what I've said today has been helpful, if it's been at all enlightening, if I'm stating the bleeding obvious, or if you think I've made some desperate, drastic mistake or omission that I should have covered, uh, please do let me know in the comments. And I'll be back in just a second. Okay, I thought I'd finished, but I forgot something. So uh, I wanted to come back and touch upon something which I mentioned earlier as something I was going to talk about, which is the Batman Miniatures game. And I'm going to move on and, and do a sort of a compare and contrast between BMG and Warhammer 40,000 because they've, they've got sort of different starting points that have brought them to a similar situation. So the big problem with the Batman miniatures game is Batman. Because Batman fundamentally does not lose. You know, he is the super prepared Boy Scout. He is always right. He always knows what's going on. Even when it looks like he's lost, he hasn't, he's won. Which in a miniatures game is a problem. Because what you need in a miniatures game is a reason to fight. Warhammer 40,000, of course, has done this perfectly. When they were first developing the setting for 40k, uh, they created this massive dystopian, dysfunctional, galaxy-spanning Imperium in which everybody always had a reason to fight everybody else including the person standing next to them so you know it's a setting that was designed for wargaming it was a setting that was designed so that there was always a good reason to be having a scrap the batman miniatures game obviously it, it's a superhero setting so there's always a reason to be having a fight but does batman fight robin generally no does two-face fight penguin well, I guess they could, but that implicit balance that 40k has, that everybody has always got a reason to fight everybody else, including themselves, doesn't exist in the Batman miniatures game. For one principal reason, and that, as I mentioned, is Batman. If you remove Batman from the game, it becomes a lot easier, because, yeah, sure, any faction could be fighting any other faction, and you could even just about, because it's DC Comics and they have some weird twisty loopy stuff, have one faction fighting itself. I see no reason why not. Just about. But as soon as you bring Batman into the game, all of a sudden it's destabilised, it's wobbly. You've got one overarching figure who is always supposed to win. 
Now, to be fair to both Night Models and to DC, that function of Batman has been worked upon many times by writers over the course of Batman's existence. So, yes, fair enough, I absolutely can hold up my hand and say, yes, there are plenty of occasions where Batman has indeed lost and failed and got it wrong. Um, and you can point to those. You know, the, the classic Broken Bat storyline is, is the most obvious example. But the problem is those points in the storyline, in the various continuities of Batman, stand out because it's unusual. So Batman the Miniatures game would work much better without Batman. But you can't have a Batman Miniatures game without Batman. It's the Batman Miniatures game. The reason people play it is because they want Batman on the tabletop. He is the big selling point. Nobody's going to play the Robin Miniatures game or the Two-Face Miniatures game. Batman is the name that's going to bring people to the table. So I understand that Night Models are in a bind. They've done a very good job of trying to balance that. And one way they've done that is to really deeply mine every possible Batman continuity. So you can have Vampire Batman, you can have Robert Pattinson Batman, you can have uh, uh, Nightfall Batman, you can have Dark Joker Batman, you know, the, the, you can even have Adam West Batman, it's all in there, you know, so that allows a lot more balance within the setting because you can have Batman versus Batman for a start. Who wins when Batman fights Batman? Well, Batman does, obviously. 40k meanwhile, has always avoided that problem until the last four years because they had a massive change in the setting, uh, which is that they let the setting move forward. Now, fundamentally, I have no problem with Games Workshop letting the 40k setting move forward at all. I think a, a, a living narrative is much more compelling. Something that players feel that they're participating in an ongoing story is really important. Infinity is a really good example of a company that, or Corvus Belli, has done it very well with Infinity. Uh, Weird Games has done it very well with Malifaux. Um, War Cradle Studios are trying to do it with uh, Wild West Exodus, and uh, TT Combat are doing it with Drop Zone Commander and Drop League Commander. You know, it, it's the flavour now that we allow our narratives to move forward, and, and I'm no exception to that. That the Horizon Wars. Um, continuity is kind of set, it's fixed. We know what the fixed points in time are in the Horizon Wars continuity, but I'm pushing through that narrative, introducing new themes, new ideas, new characters, letting the story develop as the games develop. It's a good idea. And Games Workshop getting on board with that is something I'm absolutely okay with. But there is a problem because Reboot Gulliman, or however you want to pronounce his name, um, Primarch of the Ultramarines, for 10,000 years, has lain quiescent in a stasis field, uh, with rumours abounding that one day he will heal from his mortal wounds, he will step forward impossibly from the stasis field, and he will command the Ultramarines Legion once again to crush all before them. It was a myth, it was a legend, it was something that would never happen, and then it happened. He is now a character in the current timeline of the game, um, and he is the one consistent character from the 30k Horus Heresy setting that's now being exploited to the 40k setting. He is 40k's Batman, which is weird because at the same time Conrad Kurtz is 40k's Batman. But Reboot is the hero. This is what I mean. He is the absolute world's uh, bestriding demigod of the story, not just because he's powerful, but because he's rational. Uh, he is able to look at the universe that's been created in his absence in the Imperium and go, this is wrong. Not only can he see that it is wrong, but he has the moral, intellectual and resource authority to impose his will upon the galaxy around him, to see that something is wrong and to fix it and to make it better. And the 40k universe isn't supposed to get better. It's only supposed to get worse. It's only supposed to be falling apart. It is extinction. It is the end times. It is the annihilation of all reality. 
that's that's what made it grimdark. That's what meant that you could take on any faction you liked, and it didn't matter. You were never on the wrong side because every side was the wrong side. And now 40k has a good guy. Now, some of you may say, oh, no, he's not really a good guy because he does this or he thinks that or whatever. No. By comparison to every other figure of even vaguely equivalent authority in the 40k setting, he is absolutely a good guy. Not only is he a good guy, but he is the good guy. He is the only credible unifying, unifying figure for not only the whole of humanity, but every other faction that has any capacity for rationality, the Eldar, the Tau, the Necrons, you know, they could all potentially align in some kind of unified state. Now, again, you know, you may say, well, that's never going to happen. No, of course it's not going to happen because this is 40k. But Games Workshop, in my opinion, has made a misstep by letting Gulliman be the good guy. You know, how much more interesting would it have been if he had come out with the same intellectual capacity, the same resources, the same moral authority, and yet been a deeply insane psychopath? That would have been a far more interesting step forward for Games Workshop. Um, but they haven't taken that. And, you know, part of the problem is, like Batman... 40k has become a product that Games Workshop is now selling to the world at large. It is no longer just a setting for a game. It's become a product that Games Workshop is trying to leverage to great success. Uh, I think 11% of their uh, net profits last year came from licensing. And licensing is almost 100% pure profit for Games Workshop. So I understand the financial motivations behind what they've done. But it's really undermined 40k's balance as a good setting for tabletop wargaming. So, that was all I really wanted to say on that topic. I, I mentioned earlier that I would, so I wanted to drop it in here, and we'll go straight on with the rest of the show. Thank you very much. Right, inevitably, I've got to finish this episode with one more reference to the fact that I have a Kickstarter on the way. It's not out yet, so there's no point going to try and back it now. Um, it's going to be launched on the 1st of August, but you can sign up now to get launch notification, which you'll see there. Um, and you can also sign up to my uh, weekly newsletter uh, in which I am introducing some of the products that are going to be in the Kickstarter, talking about the design process, showing off the concept art and talking about more stuff as we go along. And you can sign up for that there. Um, but I am going to relate our topic this week briefly to the Kickstarter, uh, which is the question of setting, games and miniatures, because the Kickstarter is for miniatures uh, and those miniatures have directly emerged from the setting that I wrote for Zero Dark. But they haven't emerged from it where it began. The Zero Dark setting is an evolutionary process. Um, there is a tendency amongst game designers who are independents, like me, who are trying to write their own setting for a game, to, to think that it needs to somehow be this static, perfect, canonical thing from the start. Now, there's a big thrust right now, which is a, probably a good thing amongst speculative game design uh, teams, to have settings that evolve that move on with time. Even Games Workshop has got behind the idea that the setting needs to evolve, which is a good thing, in my opinion. But I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the willingness, basically, to wreck on your stuff. To say that the setting that I write now doesn't have to be fixed in amber, and it can evolve with time. And that's definitely what I am doing with Horizon Wars, the Horizon Wars setting. It's what I've always intended to do with the Horizon Wars setting. Um, because the needs of the game come first for me. Now, whether they come first for you in your design process, if, if, you, if you're an author or an artist and you've got this massive, deep, evolved world that you don't want to change and you want to write a game for it, fine. 
But for me, it's the other way around. The game comes first. So if the needs of the game and the needs of the players are better served by a change in the setting, I will retcon the setting. Um, and I am more than happy to say that that thing I wrote about, it was wrong. I mean, if in your head you want to say it was poor information, misremembering, it was uh, uh, erroneous in the canon, whatever, I don't care. That's, that's not important to me. What's important is that I am happy to look back at stuff I've written in the past and say, yeah, you know, those events, they didn't really happen, or they happened differently to how I've said they happened. They happened this other way. Because I want the setting to evolve organically in pace with the needs of the game. And the miniatures that I'm planning to release for the Kickstarter are a really good example of that because they are inspired by characters that appear in the supplement book. Always having excuses to get my books out, trying to show them. Um, Zero Dark Operation Nemesis uh, is the, the supplement to Horizon War Zero Dark, the first supplement. There will be another one eventually. Um, so Operation Nemesis introduced Bal Anub, a special forces team from Venus operating in the fallen Earth, and the various team members of Operation Nemesis. And as I was developing this book, so I developed those characters, and those characters then appear with a narrative and a story that runs throughout the Operation Nemesis book. And I, I really enjoyed coming up with those characters. Those characters were inspired by the characters on the cover art, but they too have evolved. So the characters in Bal Anub are not directly the characters on the front cover, and the miniatures are not directly the characters on the front cover, nor directly are they Bal Anub. Because I commissioned this art from David Sondered while I was writing the rules. And even as I was writing the rules, I was writing the background, and as I was writing the background, so it was evolving and changing. So the characters that David painted, which are awesome, um, are a version of the characters that appear in the story, and the miniatures that I'm releasing are a version of the characters, both on the cover and that appear in the book. And I think that is important because even though I'm releasing miniatures, my games are still miniatures agnostic. And the miniatures themselves are then informed by that process that they are trying very hard to be as game agnostic as possible. So they are generic, hard sci-fi miniatures. Um, they are generic sort of uh, millpunk sci-fi miniatures. They uh, are inspired by the characters in Bal Anub and Operation Nemesis. And so I'm running you know, with them along those lines. I'll be part of the marketing for them. But they are also designed that if you don't even play Zero Dark, if you're not interested in the Horizon War setting, they're still going to be useful and interesting. They would stand in very nicely for a variety of different infantry type troops in sci-fi games that have got their own miniatures range, like Infinity, uh, like um, st um, ah, Brain, Moment, um, Battle Systems game that I... Core Space! There we go. I knew I'd get there eventually. Core Space. Uh, th they'd be great stand-ins for miniatures in Core Space. They'd be great stand-ins for miniatures in uh, Mantic games stuff. You know... Th they are designed to be minis that you can plonk into any sci-fi game, be it one with an IP or one that you're going to invent yourself. They're also designed so that you could use them in a variety of battlefield roles. Um, and hopefully, if the Kickstarter is sufficiently successful, we will be able to add additional parts to them so that not only will they be good characters for the roles that I had in mind for them, but for a selection of other roles as well. So. That is how the Kickstarter and the miniatures have been informed by the process that I've been talking about today when I'm talking about setting. So I have managed to come up with a reason, again, to talk about my Kickstarter. So please do sign up to do please uh, sign up to get notification of launch, join my newsletter. Um, and if 
you feel like you've got a few bob to spare every month, I would very much appreciate your support at the Patreon as well as I gear up back to doing more hobby stuff and more podcasting over the next few months. Thank you very much for listening to this episode and I will speak to you again next time. If you enjoyed this content, please consider supporting Precinct Omega via Patreon for behind the scenes, early access and exclusive extra videos and vlogs. Or help keep the show on the road and get great new games from Precinct Omega at Wargame Vault.